So this week for Integral Dharma, we're focused on the area of practice uh, of growing up. We've explored waking up and cleaning up. And I'm just going to be honest, growing up in terms of exploring it first conceptually will be the uh, sweatiest of, of everything we do. And it's going to challenge the mind a bit. So, but that's sort of the nature of growing up. Um, but I'm going to try to do this in the most essential practical way I can to make it easy to, to digest. But, and, you know, partly I say that to kind of strap in for, for the ride here. And then the goal is to really find our way into practice. So I did an interview with Ken Wilbur, was it last year, year before, um, uh, and talking in part about his, what his response is to the meta crises that we're experiencing. And in that conversation, if he had to pick one practice to do, uh, even though, you know, obviously he has the whole multitude uh, uh, practices in integral, he um, selected growing up. Like if he had to only have one practice to suggest to, to humanity, to us, it would be to focus on growing up. So that was really interesting, I thought. Um, and uh, okay, so I'm gonna kind of break down how we're gonna get through this, but real quick, I just wanted to give a short definition before we really unpack this of what growing up is. And there's a lot of different ways to talk about it, but this has to do with our depth of maturity our ability to understand and respond to, to degrees of complexity, uh, mind and mental structures through which we see and interpret reality, okay? Um, we're gonna unpack this, because that may be, maybe leave your head, your head scratching a little bit, but we're gonna unpack this. Um, so the way I wanna approach this is I'm gonna give a little comparison to waking up, cleaning up, and growing up, so you can kind of see what other flavor differences a little bit, explore a little bit more of like, what is what do I, we mean by growing up, give you some examples and metaphors that I think help demonstrate this without you know, staying too theoretical. And then we're gonna explore the stages of ego development as one example uh, of growing up, of maturing and development. And then we're gonna practice growing up and I'll explain that a little bit. And we're gonna do that through Zen noting as stages of ego development. Okay. So doing a little comparison with the, the other ups Ken had a really great summary somewhere. I don't know, uh, probably most likely from this book here. Uh, I, I highly recommend this book for anybody who really wanted to, wants to dive in for Integral with Ken Wilber, The Religion of Tomorrow. Um, all of his books tend to cover really similar ground, but this is his latest from 2018. Um, it's updated. Uh, he has some extra sections in here that I thought were really good. You know, but typical Ken fashion, you know, it's like that thick, so. <laughs> Um, but waking up, he uh, connected to freedom, waking up to freedom, cleaning up, flourishing, growing up fullness, and then showing up full functioning. Okay, so I already have some words that are differing just flavor wise. Um, another word that uh, uh, I found somewhere from him, uh, in respect to wholeness. Now I found a couple of, that he referred to here and then I kind of filled in the rest. Waking up to me would be a, like ultimate wholeness. So available immediately in our experience. And when we've practiced some embodiment awareness practices uh, from, from example, from Judith Blackstone, we're tuning to some foundational wholeness in us regardless of the, the difficulties and mess of our experience. Like there's some quality we can tap into immediately. Okay, that doesn't change, it isn't produced, isn't created, doesn't have causes and conditions. Um, with cleaning up, we're reclaiming our wholeness, healing from fragmentation to wholeness. With growing up, we're increasing the degrees of wholeness. And with showing up, uh, the phrase that I put there, and we'll explore more of that next week, is enacting, supporting, and catalyzing wholeness. Okay, now one last little quick recap, which I explored last week with you all. Cleaning up has to do with the past, healing, making whole what was fragmented, okay, and harmed us in the past that carries forward. And growing up is about the future, opening up to what we haven't seen before. We're opening up to new dimensions of our experience of reality um, that we can think, feel, and perceive in more complex ways, and we can include much more. So this has to do with our potential. 
So it's not just immediately available like what we experience in waking up. And it's not about simply reclaiming our past. This is about unfolding into more, into more complexity, into more depth, into more embrace, a deeper embrace of experience of ourselves and others in reality. Okay, now let's dive in a little bit more specifically. Now we have some met uh, metaphors there. So what is growing up? Um, again, developing and maturing to our complexity. In particular, we can, we can use different phrases um, here. Our stances, our perspectives, our mental structures that filter and limit or enable how we're interpreting uh, our experience in reality, okay? This is usually key here. How we're making sense out of it, the conclusions we arrive at and how we respond. This whole mechanism by which we do it is what we're referring to, to here in, in terms of maturity and growing up, increasing our abilities to do that. Now with this, this uh, we're talking about development growing up, we can talk about stages and orders of complexity and we, we use this lightly, which I'll talk about, about more later. Um, and uh, for example, our sense of self um, can become more and can become bigger and include more, or it can be less and less narrow. Uh, 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 can be more narrow or less narrow, okay? That's another way of, of describing it. So Ken had a, a one way of describing this pretty succinctly. Um, when we're talking about development and um, stages of development within ourselves and our ability to, to perceive and uh, interpret it and, and respond to reality. He says, the point is that each of these major stages of human development adds a new perspective, a new larger degree of consciousness and thus consciousness itself continues to grow, expand and become larger and larger, more and more whole. And this greater wholeness grows along with our greater and greater capacity for love, care, identity, concern, morals, compassion, creativity, and so on. So that's a nice succinct definition of what we're exploring here. So kind of taking a little bit of that, we can form a question, what is our sense of self and other? What is included in who we take ourselves to be and how we experience others? Who, what, or how many, how much does this include? This is something we can feel into and actually work with and cultivate. Um, now, in that quote there, he mentioned love, care, identity, concern, morals, compassion. Um, these each can be like their own area of development, okay? So there's so many ways that we can deepen and mature and develop. And uh, there's not just like one area. So we can, much like we have waking up and cleaning up and growing up, showing up as one uh one way to look at our experience and look in each direction and inform our practice, we can do the same thing with growing up, look at different ways in which we're maturing as human beings. And how we demarcate all of this in terms of what he calls lines of development and the stages of development, so much room for interpretation and making those delineations and then that is not what's important. What's important is to tune to this process in our own experience. And we use these maps of our development simply to help us orient and reference to help inform our practice experience, not to like set a map out here and say, okay, here's where I'm gonna go and achieve, you know? It's the same thing with like waking up, like we have the phases of insight and the waves of wakefulness as reference points that are stages of waking up not stages of uh, the development we're talking about here. If it's helpful, it's helpful, okay? But the, the, the assertion here is that, that it maturing and developing is part of our experience, just like, for example, um, an acorn becoming an oak tree, okay? Like there is this process of increasing order of complexity um, that happens within us. Now, um, some metaphors are helpful here too. Because the, the thing is that it's, this starts conceptually because that's what we're dealing with here is partly what we're doing with our mind, right? In, in engaging reality. Um, but it's some, this is also one of the hardest practices out of the four ups, I think, to find our way into. There are not that many overt practices. Waking up, you couldn't even ever get to the end of the list of practices and meditations. Cleaning up, there's so many modalities you can find. But growing up, very tricky. We're going to, have to talk about a few ways to practice this. So a few metaphors that we have to, you know, hold lightly, you know, this is just to help you orient here. Um, one is, is, is talking about like an operating system or a hardware for a computer. Okay. Um, now I'm going to give you other metaphors. So if this one is like going to make your head scratch, 
don't worry, it'll be very brief. <laughs> but, um, you know, the computer, the iPhone has an operating system and you can run applications on it. Okay. Um, if uh, the operating system has a bug or a virus, right, you can go in and clean that up and then make sure the operating system can run at its normal potential. But it's it has a limited potential. Every iPhone, for example, the new iPhone just came out. I've had mine since, I don't know, five years ago or something like that. And maybe I'll get a new one. That new phone is gonna do all kinds of things that this phone just cannot do. Its capacity is significantly different, okay? It'll do some of the same things. It'll do everything that this phone can do right here. It'll do everything that this can do and a little more, okay? And that's because the hardware and the operating system is upgraded. It has more potential, okay? And um, now that gets at this a little bit, but it gets at it in another way. I'm gonna read something from Ken that this is really important here. That what we're pointing to is hard to see. And actually in some ways it's almost impossible to see. Um, so he says, these stages of development are not a direct first person experience. And so they remain largely hidden. They are not something you are looking at. They are something you are looking at the world through and with. The frameworks and hidden maps that you use to make sense of your experience in your world and without which uh, reality is just a blooming buzzing confusion. So the key differentiation here is we're looking through this. Every, in every moment we're looking through these structures of mind and how we're interpreting, interpreting our experience and responding to it. So they're not objects of, of our consciousness, they're the structures of our consciousness. And so, but these structures can grow and mature. And um, I, I mentioned this before, but with, with children, this is like the, the, probably the area that we can most easily identify with. And I think most people who, if you are a parent or in a caregiver role or a teacher, we easily see the development of kids and their abilities, you know, as they, as they grow and grow. And uh, with my stepdaughter, it's just amazing. It's like every week, it's just like something else comes online and she's able to do something. It's like, whoa, you know, days or weeks. It's amazing. And as adults though, there's the idea in the realm of, uh, at least in the past of, of like say psychology and our own experience that we just stop. That process just stops. And this is something that Robert Keegan, who's one of my favorite uh, developmental psychologists, points to that, that, yeah, we just think like we turn 18 or something like that. And then that's it. We are, we are done developing as human beings. And it's like, well, no, we're not actually. That's just a, an assumption that, that we've held for too long. So anyways, this is very much known. And it's like not a, in my experience, not a crazy or weird thing to talk about when we talk about children and adolescents, but as adults, we're like, wait a minute, what? I develop? What are you talking about? Um, so another example here, again, holding this really lightly, I kind of mentioned this before, but if we think about a bucket, okay, which I know that's the perfect metaphor for the mind, right? A bucket, but um, cleaning up would be like having a, some holes in the bucket, okay? We patch these up and then the, have the more of the, the given potential of that bucket. Uh, but growing up is getting a bigger bucket. It can hold more. Um, it, because it's development is not just about putting more information in the mind that's a really good thing to do is to learn more, but that doesn't change this order of degree of complexity for, through which we can understand the world, okay? That's what we're talking about here. Now, another one, and this, Ken gives this example in the, uh, in the interview uh, that I did with him with Buddhist Geeks. He talks about seeing a ball and, and, and especially with um, starting with a kid. Now, what's interesting is like when kids are really, really little, I'll give you an example. There's a story my family tells me of, I used to have a, a Bert and Ernie doll and uh, I lost it at the mall when I was really little. I don't know, I probably was like two years old or something and I flipped out. I just lost my shit and they tried to go hunt for it. They went back to the mall, they couldn't find it. They tried to buy a new one and give it to me. And then I was like, no, that's not mine. And there's just no consoling me. There was some sense at that time and age where I was just, I was fused with that object. You know what I mean? Like, like you can see kids in, like an object is like, there's no, almost no difference. It's like, I am this object. It's me. And the pain of it is just so overwhelming. Right now uh, with a ball, the, 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 the process you can do is, is um, have a ball and it has two colors of sides to it. Like one red and uh, one green. And you ask the kid uh, what colors is the ball and they're going to, at one age, you're going to say red. And if you say, well, what color am I seeing? They're going to say red, even though I'm seeing green, because that's a 
that's an order of abstraction to hold that, to hold both my perspective and your perspective at the same time is a leap up. And then later you can do that. You can say, oh, I'm seeing red, but you're seeing green. And then we can even take a step back and witness ourselves doing that process of looking, you know? And so you can see how we can keep adding layers of perspectives uh, to this in order to understand, understand more complexity. Um, yeah, okay. So now, again, I, we're, we're wading our way into growing up here, fine, orient ourselves. So now if we want, let's look at a really handy, very simple to understand uh, line of development that we'll work with today. And this is stages of ego development or self-development. This is the model that Ken uses a lot, but there are other theorists connected to this. And honestly, I get them all confused about like who came from where and then when Ken had adapted it, but you can explore more of that in one of his books. Um, so I'm just gonna go down these. And uh, the first is egocentric. I'll just read them off. Egocentric, sociocentric, world-centric, planet-centric, and cosmocentric. So, uh, and I'll even give you the quick, uh, my other quick summary of this. Me, us, all of us, uh, all beings everywhere and the planet and everything and everyone everywhere without limits and boundaries. Okay, so even what I said there, you can start getting a sense of orders of complexity of how we identify and take ourselves. So egocentric, me, um, it's all about me. That's what that, I have a focus on me and I feel connected to myself. So that's a positive way of saying this. So what's really important with any of these, there's not an inherent negative judgment of it, but there will be noticed a limitation and, and something added with each order of complexity. But uh, you know, an egocentric, it's about me, and I. And at that stage, it's I can take care of myself, but I can't really consider or take other people's perspectives. That's harder. Okay. Sociocentric is us, and I feel connected to those who are like me. And so here, that us could be family, religion, tribe, nation, some identified group. I'm a part of this group, and there's us, and then there's everybody else. Okay. It's not all of us. It's us. And this is a very healthy level of development. And this is seen a lot with kids. So younger kids, you know, that's what you're aiming for is to say, okay, it's understandable for a while that your focus go on yourself, but at a certain period of time, you have to also consider the needs of family or the needs of other people. You're part of a group. So this is a very healthy unfolding, but we can also see where that becomes limited, where if it's like, if you're not part of the us that I am, then you're out and, and, you know, maybe I have negative views of who you are. And maybe I shun you from, from uh, being a part of the, the, the group, you know, and there's a lot of pain that's created in that way. Um, World-centric, all of us. So I feel, feel connected to all of us, no matter who they or we are, okay? And this is regardless of race, identity, and religion, et cetera. It's like, even though you're different, you're included in this all of us, this big embrace, Planet centric. This is one interesting one that that Ken added later. It wasn't in his uh, first big integral book, but I quite like it. Um, so all beings everywhere, not just human beings. So and the planet. I feel connected to the whole planet and all beings. So here, you know, you can get a sense of n not just you know not just my species, but all beings. This whole planet, this whole ecosystem, okay, is included in the embrace. Just one layer. Uh, deeper and larger. And then cosmocentric really hits towards something on waking up really is this uh, what he'll say manifest and unmanifest it form and emptiness, like everything, no boundaries. And we identify with that of embracing everything. Now, a, a super key phrase from Ken is transcend and include. So all these levels uh, of complexity, wherever we feel we understand or where we're coming from, all the other levels are still part of us. They're absolutely part of us. You know, so um, if we feel we're a world centric embrace, all of us, we still care about ourselves. We still take care of ourselves. We still have that uh, egocentric focus within ourselves. It's just not the only thing. We also have sociocentric and world centric part of us. So that's very important to keep in mind. Um, 
Now, what's interesting here, why this becomes important, like why is this you know relevant to the world? Well, if we look at world centric, uh, world level problems, like something like climate change, this is something that affects the entire world. This is not something that's like only part of one country and part of some other country over there. That's going to require a world centric level of consciousness to embrace it and to solve it. Like that's, and this is an assertion that Ken made. And uh, he even talked about it sort of in a compassionate way that if someone isn't at that place, they're just not gonna be able to conceive of that, of that problem. And they might deny it in all sorts of ways, but part of it might be a problem of that, that just they're not at a place to conceive of that big of an us. And so when you talk to them about climate change, it's gonna be like, I don't know, it doesn't compute. So here encouraging a growing up that can embrace that much would be really, really important. Ke Robert Keegan talks about this in his book, which is, uh, this is the most well-known book um, in Over Our Heads. He talks about the demands we make. He has a slightly different uh, model, um, but that's really related orders of consciousness. And he talks about the demands we make on each other and people in society from kids, adolescents, to partners, to people in the workplace. And so, so many times what we're making demands of is demands of maturing, you know, of, of saying basically like we want each other to, to grow up. But if we don't have a way to talk about growing up, it's a very frustrating process that kind of we, our wheels spin. So um, let's talk about like practicing this a little bit before we actually do it. Again, as I mentioned, and with the Kin quote earlier about this is not something we see as objects, this is something we see with. You know, it's how we see, it's how we filter the world. It's kind of hard to get at. And so far as I've seen, mostly it's about creating the causes and conditions. So just like if we think about a seed in a tree, if you create enough optimal causes and conditions, that seed will grow into a tree, you know? And it seems a similar, like if we look at environments for children, if you create healthy, supportive environments, maturation happens. So how do we do that for each other, especially as adults? Um, so one of the ways it gets talked about, we're actually, we'll probably work with this in, in a different way another time in this training, but subjects and subject and object, turning what is subject into object. And we kind of already have played with this a little bit. Um, but here, because the ways which we're, we're viewing the world are just purely subject to us, meaning that we don't know they exist. It's like, how can we start turning this into something that we see, that we know about ourselves that we can explore? And that's really the trick here. Keegan had um, another book called Immunity to Change, which was a little bit more focused on the, in the workplace, but the practices are really interesting. And there's a, essentially a practice to write down assumptions we have about reality and life like, this is how things are, this is how it works, et cetera, et cetera. And then we try to test those assumptions in life, like an experiment. And it can be really fruitful. Again, it's such a weird process because how the hell do we identify the assumptions in the first place? It's a mystery. How do these subjects become objects? I don't know. <laughs> but it's uh, that, that kind of process seems to work. It's like, how can I start getting at assumptions and testing those? Um, perspective taking is uh, another way to do this. When we, and, he, and that was something Kinnick suggested. It's like, it's interesting because perspective taking takes a certain level of maturation to do in the first place. So there's kind of a, sometimes it's like, well, a certain level of unfolding has to happen in order to practice taking perspectives. But if we can inhabit another person's perspective and try to understand where they're coming from, that can start jolting our own assumptions. Um, um, but for me, it seems to be a process of how radically I can do that. I always have a limit of how radically I can try to inhabit, you know, and let go of my own assumptions at the same time so I can uh, free that up and, and take the perspective. So what we're going to do today, I'm kind of calling inhabiting stages within us. So we're going to inhabit through Zen noting these levels of ego development. So uh, with Zen noting, we say, as egocentric mind, there is. And what do we notice? So I'm gonna inhabit egocentric mind. That's what I'm inhabiting. And there is, let me do this. As egocentric mind, 
there is focus. As egocentric mind, there is tightening. As egocentric mind, hmm, there is impulsiveness. So it could go any number of directions here. There's not a prescription here, except there is a little bit in the sense of like, what do we mean by egocentric mind? And I tried to give you a little description of that, but we're really trying as much as possible to inhabit just that, even if we feel called to, to bigger ways of, of embracing reality. This is really helpful to get in touch with that and ourselves to own that, to see a distinction, and then to inhabit a uh, sociocentric mind. As sociocentric mind, there is concern. As sociocentric mind, there's worry. That's what's coming up for me today. And we can go on and on, okay? So that's what we're gonna do today. And those are some ways to practice at this. Again, in my experience, there is not a whole bunch of just clear cut practices at this, but I'm hoping some of the things I've said might jolt something for you. And then we'll practice this today to see what, what arises.